The next topic is going to be something called Fubini's theorem. So first of all, I like to say I just think if you have a name this neat, it's really good that you attach it to a theorem. So it's just sort of, for me anyway, it's fun to say. <laughs> and so this function, so remember my big question at the end of, of the last set of slides. If f of x is continuous on the rectangle r equals uh, ab cross cd, so this is just in between a and b on the x-axis and in between c and d on the y-axis, then Fubini's theorem tells me that the double integral over that region, over that rectangle, is equal to, and I can do it either dy dx, so I can, it's equal to the value of the iterated integral, and it doesn't matter which way I do the iterated integral. So if I do dy dx, or I do dx dy, and so remember, we have to be a bit careful that the ab corresponds to the dx, so they have to be on the inside or on the outside, but you can't mix. And here, the AB corresponds to the DX. So the order of iteration does not matter. And so in this particular case, when I'm talking about a rectangle, it's not going to make too big a deal which way you do this first. Later on, you're going to find that you look at a, a region. It's not always going to be defined just as, you know, this is A, this is B. There's going to be functions that give you the region, too. For instance, if you wanted to integrate over a triangle or a circle or something like that. And it's going to be a lot easier, generally, to do dy dx or dx dy. So one of them is either going to be very difficult or impossible. I mean, they both might be very difficult or impossible, but sometimes one is very difficult and the other one is relatively easy. And so just, just for your own sanity, I would recommend doing it the easy way. So. One of the things I like to do when I have a theorem like that is just test it out. So let's try an example and see what happens. So I'm going to define the rectangle to be 1, 3, cross 2, 5. So this is just in between 1 and 3 on the x-axis and in between 2 and 5 on the y-axis. My function will be 2y minus 3x, and I want to compute the double integral over that rectangle So using Fubini's theorem, I can say that this double integral is going to be equal to the iterated integral. And so in this case, I'll integrate with respect to x first, and then I'll integrate with respect to y. So again, the 1, 3 is here, and that's my x limits. So I have to do dx first if the 1 and 3 are in here. And then 2 and 5 are the limits corresponding to y. And so the way I'm going to do this inside integral now, I'm integrating with respect to x. So I'm just going to pretend like y is a constant. And then I can treat this just as a single variable integral. So the first term, this is just a constant times dx. So by the anti-power rule, all that's going to happen when I take the antiderivative of that, just an x shows up. And if I were to take the partial derivative of this term with respect to x, I would just get 2y, which is exactly what I started out with. The second term, the minus, three, minus 3x, that's the derivative of minus 3x squared. So if I take the derivative, again, partial derivative with respect to x, but it's easier to miss that it's a partial derivative because there's no y in this term. I would take 2 times 3 halves to the times x to the 2 minus 1, which would just be 3x. And now I can evaluate this at the limits. So it's, I guess I was a bit lazy when I wrote the limits here. But once I've done this, there's no more dx in here to tell me what variable I've integrated with respect to. So with 2, it's not too bad. But we can use the same idea of iteration to do triple integrals, quadruple integrals, and so on. So it's probably a good habit to remember that this is x equals 3 as the upper limit and x equals 1 as the bottom limit. But otherwise, I do it exactly the same way that I would have done uh, using the fundamental theorem of calculus. So the value of this integral is just the antiderivative evaluated at the upper limit minus the antiderivative evaluated at the lower limit. This thing's the antiderivative. So all I'm going to do is put in 3 for x in the first term and then minus 
and then substitute in 1 for x in the second term. And so now I've integrated out the x. There's no longer an x in here, but there still are some y's. And so this is now my, my partial integral. So it's now a function of y that I can integrate in the second step with respect to y. First, though, I think I probably simplified it because uh, addition is going to make this a little bit prettier. So it turns out that's just equal to 4y minus 12. And so then this is something we should be reasonably familiar with now. So I'll just go through this quickly. So I get the antiderivative evaluated at the top limit and subtract the evaluation at the bottom limit. And so that gives me 50 minus 60. So that's negative 10 minus 8 minus 24. So it's tricky again. I know some of us don't like signs and pluses. But that's minus 10 minus negative 16, which is equal to 6. So in this case, I did the integral. I iterated with the dx integral first, and then the dy integral. And so let's try that again. But this time, I'm going to do dy first. So I, had to, I switched, the, oops, switched the dy and dx. And then I also had to switch the two integral signs. So the, now that the inside limits, the 2 and the 5, these correspond to integration with respect to y. And the 1 and the 3, the outside integral, corresponds to integration with respect to x. So again, just to use the anti-power rule, 2y is the anti or 2y is the derivative of y squared. And then 3x is going to be constant with respect to y. So that just becomes 3xy. And then again, I just evaluate this at y equals 5. And I evaluate it at y equals 2. And then I take the difference. So this is the, the function evaluated when y is equal to 5. And this is the function evaluated when y is equal to 2. And now I just have a function. The y is entirely gone. So I have a function of only x, and I'm going to integrate that function from 1 to 3. So first, uh, I'll do some simplification. And then the antiderivative is trivial again, just with the, the power rule. So I get 21x minus 9 halves x squared from 1 to 3. So I evaluate this at 3, evaluate at 1, take the difference. And so it's a, a little bit uh, less pretty this time. But if I have 63 minus 21, that gives me 42. And then I have negative 81 over 2, and then minus minus 9 over 2. So that's the same as negative 81 plus 9 over 2, which is 72 over 2, which is 36. So I have minus 36, and again, I get 6. And just for uh, people who weren't paying attention on the last slide, that's the same answer we got when we did the integral iterated the other direction. So that's a, a pretty good check. If I have a, a simple function, at least it works. And this actually does work in general, so you don't need to check it. But um, just wanted to go through a, a little example. OK, so the next thing we might want to do, so, so far I've just talked about doing a double integral over a rectangular region. Um, but now suppose, instead of a rectangle, I want to have a more general region that I'm going to call D. So I've, I've, I think on the first set of slides, I called the area in the xy plane that I was integrating above, I called that the domain of integration. So that's why I chose D here. It just means domain. And I'm going to write this using a set notation. So these little squiggly brackets. Uh, this means I'm talking about a set. And a set is just a rule to say something's in the set or something's not in the set. And so the way you read this is the set it consists of points x, y that satisfy x has to be in between a and b. And then y has to in, be in between a function of x and another function of x. So there's some function of x on the bottom and some function of x on the top. And so for a rectangle, g1 of x was just equal to c, and g2 of x was equal to d. And now this is just letting me have a, a slightly more general region. So I could have an upward sloping line, and that could be either a trapezoid or a triangle or something like that. 
And so then when I do my iterated integral, I don't really have the freedom to do it dx dy or dy dx anymore. So in this case, I have to do the dx last because those are where I have the, the constants in, uh, in the limits. If, so if I find an antiderivative of f of x, y, I'm going to evaluate it at y equals some function of x, and again at y equals this lower bound of x. So after I've done this inside integral, I'm going to have a function of x alone, and then that's going to be something I can integrate in my second integral. But the, the limits on the last integral always have to be real numbers. Otherwise, you know, there's no way for me to integrate. If I had a, a function of y here, then when I did my antiderivative and then plugged in my function of y, I would still have a function of both x and y, so it wouldn't be an iterated integral anymore. And so this is kind of, this is what I was getting at when I said sometimes it's easier or impossible to do an integral, um, you know, dx dy or dy dx. You can actually draw a picture of what this region looks like. And if it's bounded both directions, you'll always be able to find a way to describe that as a to b with a function making the top and another function making the bottom. Or you could think of it as you know, c to d with one function making the left side and one function making the right side. And one of those might be easier to do than the other. So I think uh, there's an example in the homework of, of how this will work out where one of the limits is basically what you need to be able to do integration by substitution in the outside integral. Okay. And so this is just the other possibility. So D can either have X having the real limits, so X between A and B, and then Y between functions of X, or you can have Y between C and D, and then have X in between functions of Y. And so all that happens here is you just have to integrate. So here I do dy dx first, and here I have to do dx dy first. Okay. So we might see something like this. So if I say x plus y, so absolute value of x plus absolute value of y has to be less than or equal to 1. So this describes a, a diamond that just has corners at 0, plus or minus 1, and plus or minus 1, 0. So it's usually helpful to draw a picture of what this looks like. Even if it's not a very good picture, it'll still help you figure out which way is going to be easier, whether you want to do x first or y first. And then this is a, a useful check just to make sure you've done things right in, in getting your region. So if I, have, if I define my function, the integrand f of x, y, just to be constant 1 over the entire domain, then when I integrate that, I'm just going to get the area of my domain. So if I have a, an area and I multiply it by 1 to get a volume, then that volume is just going to be equal to the area. So my double integral over this diamond d I can write that just as 1 dA. And now this is a bit tricky, so it's a good example, though, of how you can split up an integral. So I'm going to integrate with respect to x last, so that means that the x limits get to be real numbers. And conceptually, what I want to do is I want to start at negative 1 here and go over to positive 1. And just like I could break up the, the interval into two sub-intervals, so two interval, intervals that together make the full interval for a single variable integration problem. I can split up the domain into pieces so that all of those pieces together make the entire domain. And so what I'm going to do is this function will be much easier to describe if it doesn't have this sort of sharp right-hand corner at the top. Uh, same with the one on the bottom. So I'm going to integrate from negative 1 to 0, and then from 0 to positive 1. And then my limits for y 
are at a certain value of x, I'm going to go from, this is actually negative 1 plus x, so negative 1 minus x is the point down here. So if x were equal to negative 1 half, then y would equal negative 1 half as well. And so what I want to do is just set up a, a function. So the, the limits here, minus 1 minus x and 1 plus x, given x, just tell me how far it is from down here to up here. And then the functions are slightly different on the right-hand side. The, the slope just changes. So I have um, just where I had plus x over here, I'm going to end up with minus x over here, and the same in the, in the bottom. And then all that I have to do is start my iterated integral. So the integral of 1 with respect to y, that's just going to be the derivative of y. So I end up with y evaluated at the top limit minus y evaluated at the bottom limit. So what I'm going to do when I evaluate this now, I'm going to stick in 1 plus x for y. And, so, and then the same thing for the, for the right-hand integral. And so what I end up with is top limit minus bottom limit for the, for the integral on the left term. And then top limit minus bottom limit for the integral that's the, the right-hand term. And then I go ahead and simplify that. So I get 2 plus 2x and 2 minus 2x. But now I have two single variable integration problems. And again, they're pretty easy. So just use the power rule backwards. And we get 1 plus 1, which is 2. And I guess I'll flip back to this. So if I were to take this triangle in the bottom right side and put it up here, then I'd have a square. And if I took this one and put it up here, I'd have another square. So that would be a rectangle, these two squares. So it'd be width 2 and height 1. So the area of this shape should be equal to 2. And that's what we got when we did our integral. So everything's working out so far. Oh, and I guess I, I should mention, so on the first slide when I put Fubini's theorem up, I said that it was over a rectangle. 